We live in an age of political polarization and preference bubbles, of economic change, rising threats, and a rapidly changing world. Canada needs to stay relevant. We need more smart conversations. We need to dive into critical issues and big ideas with passion and unrestrained optimism. I'm Aaron O'Toole. Welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. Welcome to Blue Skies. Today, we're talking about war, not the war being fought in Ukraine today we, against the Russian aggression in that country, but back to the Second World War and one of the most pivotal battles within it. And what can we learn from that war and that battle today? Now, any listener to the Blue Skies will know that I'm a Winston Churchill aficionado, a Churchillian, you might say. And his quote on this battle sums up the issues best. The only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. He went on to say, without victory, there is no survival. Winston Churchill, of course, was talking about the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest World War II campaign. The United Kingdom requiring one million tons of supplies per week not just, as our author will remind us, for the war effort itself, but for the 40 million civilians that depended on that lifeline across the Atlantic. And there was a steep cost to the Battle of the Atlantic. 36,000 plus killed naval forces on the Allied side, an almost equal number, 36,000, from the merchant navy as well. 175 warships, 741 aircraft, and 3,500 merchant vessels. That lifeline of supply was critical to the war effort and to the Allied success. So today we're talking a bit of military history. Our listeners know this is a subject that I love to explore from time to time. And we're so fortunate to be joined by one of Canada's leading historians, one of its leading authors on our military history. Ted Barris is an accomplished author, journalist, broadcaster, and professor. He's done stints on CBC Radio, TV Ontario, and the Globe and Mail, and he's the author of over 20 nonfiction books on history. He also recently retired as a professor of journalism from Toronto's Centennial College. In recent years, some of his notable books have been The Great Escape, A Canadian Story, which was a Libris nonfiction book of the year in 2014. He also wrote a great book on the story Dam Busters, Canadian Airmen and the Secret Raid Against Nazi Germany, which won the RCAF Association NORAD Trophy. He was also recently or, uh, awarded the Order of Canada, our country's highest order in the honours list, from last December. And today, we're going to be talking about Battle of the Atlantic, Gauntlet to Victory. So welcome to the Blue Skies Political Podcast, Ted Barris. Aaron, a delight to be back with you. Well, it's a delight to be with you. And we have explored history before. You've appeared on a previous podcast, one of my early podcasts, talking about our shared love of the story of Sam Sharp from Uxbridge, where you hail from and the 116th Battalion. You've done great work on uh, World War I, World War II, your book on medics. You, you've really brought a, a special look on Canadian military history, but you're now treading into the longest campaign of World War II, something that is immense topic. What drew you, Ted, to this latest book focused on the Battle of the Atlantic? Well, I've read all of the academics works, um, Mark Milner, uh, Roger Sarti, um, David Berkison, Jack Granitstein. They've all covered, the academics have covered this subject uh, over the last 30, 40 years pretty thoroughly in terms of the context of it, in terms of the nuts and bolts of why it was necessary to keep England, the military, and the civilians, as you alluded to earlier, alive. But I've been collecting interviews with veterans for over 50 years now and one of them just sort of burned in the back of my mind and if you don't mind I'll share with you the moment from 1976. I was sitting in Saskatoon working at a radio station there 
And one of the producers I was working with said, you know, we really do need to do something for Remembrance Day. It was coming up to November 11th. So I did what any good journalist does. I went to the Legion. <laughs> Remember, it's 1976. So there were many more veterans around. But in this instance, I interviewed a man named Harold T. Doig, who hailed from Winnipeg. And I was curious to know where he'd served, what he'd done. And, and he said he'd served in the Navy. And I said, had you ever been to sea before? He said, hell, I had never even seen it. <laughs> so I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I and my kid brother, George, and my older brother, Jack, all joined. Jack went into the Air Force, uh, later, unfortunately, shot down and lost. Uh, he, uh, Harold H.T., as we used to call him, and his younger brother, George, go to sea in the Royal Canadian Navy. And H.T. worked in Halifax. And I said to, I said to him, how did you and George relate to the ocean when you'd never seen it. He said, Ted, look around Saskatchewan. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, most of the time, the sky blends right into the ground and there's no discernible object on the horizon to relate to. What does that remind you of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I said, I get it. And I said, well, and it, so it was easy for you and your younger brother, George, to do all this. And he said, well, I didn't see George, who was, I think he said he was 19. His younger brother was 19. He said, I didn't see him for about a year because he went off to the North Atlantic and he served on a number of corvettes defending the convoys against the U-boat attacks. He went to Murmansk a couple of times. He said, I didn't see him for a year. He came back to Halifax and he said, I hadn't seen him and I looked at him in the face and his hair had gone white from his experience at sea. This is a 19-year-old kid. And that interview and the thought that young Canadians from every walk of life and every geographical point had joined this incredible battle made me realize that I had to deal with this subject sooner or later. And then, of course, um, many more interviews, because I've probably interviewed 6,000 veterans, emerged from Navy, Air Force, people who worked in intelligence because breaking the, the Enigma codes were, was vital to this story. All these people sort of emerged and began to eat away at my conscience to say, do this story. And then the pandemic happened. So I had no other choice but to sit here in my office and bang it out. So uh, that's what I did. Well, the story comparing the the prairie landscape to the to the sea to the ocean is a good one when the ocean's relatively calm. But in the yes. North Atlantic, uh, they would have seen mountains when the Bering Sea State got up uh, beyond uh, five and six. I remember sailing on HMCS St. John's during a storm when it certainly looked a little bit more like the Rockies than, than, than the prairies. But I do think that is what was remarkable about our war effort. We had young men, but also women, signing up with no direct connection to the sea, no direct connection in some cases with many of the Ukrainians uh, with, in, in uh, the prairies to, to Britain. Um, and the service was literally incredible. We also look at, at Canada's, uh, Canada's peacetime Navy, and this is an, a, a subject that we're, we're really struggling with now, uh, not being prepared from the Canadian Armed Forces. But at the beginning of World War II, Royal Canadian Navy had 13 ships and 3,500 sailors. By the end of the war, we had 400 ships and 100,000 100, sailors. The the story of Mr. Doig and his brother, that incredible ramp up, was that as a response to, to the gauntlet? It, was this Battle of the Atlantic critical in the overall victory? And did Canada have to ramp up incredibly to, to make, make it live up to the challenge? Yes, 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 and yes. Um, the ships were in such small uh, supply at the beginning of the war that uh, we had to borrow destroyers to ramp up our commitment to protecting the convoys. Imagine that you've got um, every other day, perhaps 40, 50, 60 ships leaving North America from the ports of North Sydney and Halifax bound for Britain. And in order to get across the Atlantic and around the U-boats, they needed the escorts. And the escorts were initially just a bunch of uh, corvettes and minesweepers and trawlers and yachts. I mean, it was really minimal. And the U-boats were overwhelming in the middle of the North Atlantic. 
um, partly because of the Air Force, which was really um, stuck with twin engine aircraft that could only go out so far to give air cover. Uh, the objective, obviously, of both the escorts and the Air Force was to drive the U-boats underwater because submerged, they could om almost but not quite keep up with the convoys. So if they could drive the U-boats down, that would break the contact between the U-boats and the convoys and allow the convoys travel unimpeded. But on the surface, the U-boats could travel 14, 15, 16 knots, and they could just weave around them and uh, dodge the escorts, which were in such short supply and so ill-equipped initially in the war, that it was a field day for them. And in the middle of the North Atlantic, where the aircraft couldn't give any cover, um, it, was, it was called a black pit. And until the Air Force had aircraft of four engine varieties like the Liberator, for example, later, late in the war, we couldn't give them the cover that would give them protection all the way. And so- Yeah, let's, let's, let's paint that picture even better, the Black Pit. So we're talking about the naval and the air, air effort here. The Air Force could fly out from Newfoundland, from Iceland, or from the UK. Right. And so the range out and back meant that center, that Black Pit you talked about, was beyond the range of aerial patrol. Right. And so only the convoy escorts would provide protection at that point. So is that essentially where the wolf pack, where the German U-boats sat waiting for that area where they could launch their attacks in the Black Pit? Or was this something they had to be ready for submarine attack from the moment they sailed out of Halifax Harbor? Pretty much both. There, there was the threat everywhere. I mean, the, uh, before the convoys left Halifax and North Sydney, the escorts, the sweepers, swept the harbors and the exteriors just around them because the U-boats were laying mines in there and they were just as dangerous. But the, clearly the most dangerous area was where there was no protection and where um, you alluded earlier to the rough weather. Well, the worst weather was in the middle of the North Atlantic, too, just where this black pit was. So if there was no Air Force coverage to keep the U-boats down from the air, and the escorts were uh, thwarted and swamped by the horrible weather, uh, the conditions were just the worst for the ability of the escorts to move around and attempt to protect uh, the convoys. And the losses between 1939 and 1942 could be as many as 25 to 30 percent of the convoys. And you're talking about um, that million tons of uh, required goods to Britain, we all learned in grade five in social studies class that Britain was entirely a maritime economy. Everything came from offshore, everything. So we're talking about energy, coal, gas, electricity, all those things would be supplied by uh, inbound fuel. Um, everything from fruits to vegetables, to meats, to the the kinds of uh, units that would be used to, to keep the mining industry going, uh, equipment, um, wooden, uh, uh, you know, timber, all of the things that were um, regularly flowing into Britain every day had to continue to do that, else Britain, not just the military and the industry, but the civilians would wither and die. And, and I mean, the prospect that Churchill faced, because that threat you talked about in the introduction, he might well have had to direct the war from Ottawa had England fallen because of the lack of supply and, and essentially the invasion that was threatened in 1940. So um, that black pit was death for the convoys until the escorts could get the greater supply of equipment. Um, and, and the additional problem we had, because young men had to fill the gaps that those uh, ships required to crew them, in those early years of the war, we were ramping up training and, and, and recruitment and volunteerism to get those ranks full, but we were spread so thin like a veneer across all those ships. We didn't mm -hmm. have nearly the capability in the crews to be the strongest and, and the most uh, uh, wily about dealing with U-boats until late 1942, early 43. Yeah, well, and we'll get to some of the adaptations in a moment. But I do think, you know, when I was at military college, the one thing many of the military history professors really, you know, taught us well was the fact that after such brilliant exploits in World War I, Canada really, you know, demobbed, put down, you know, the, the desire to maintain some of those military levels. And so we're, we're really caught flat-footed with our Navy, as I said, only 13 ships, but having to supply 
Britain throughout the war. And so we ramped up. I remember one of my first cabinet meetings, one of the war art uh, paintings in the cabinet room was um, shipbuilding in Ashbridge's Bay, which of course is, I lived in the beaches in Toronto. Ashbridge's Bay is, is you know, now a touristy kind of area of Toronto. They were building ships there during the war. Did we just suddenly realize we need to go from 13 ships to 400 ships? And did we just squeeze out every little shipyard and create new ones to respond to building the, the corvettes and the other, the other escorts to make the Battle of the Atlantic a possibility? Well, uh, we all know the story of C.D. Howe coming into government just as the, the King government is, is beginning to launch the response to the, the war effort and, and, the, and the declaration of war against Germany. C.D. Howe uh, realized that uh, industry was going to build those ships. And what was the best ship to, to build was the Corvette because it was cheap. Uh, Churchill referred to the Corvettes as the cheap and nasties. <laughs> uh, they were built for $530,000 each, and it, it was a capability we could provide. We could build Corvettes because they were shallow draft all around the Great Lakes, all mm -hmm. through the shipyards in New Brunswick, up the St. Lawrence, and then deliver them to North Sydney in, and in um, uh, Halifax at the peak, maybe two and three Corvettes a month. That's how we ramped from 13 to 400 ships was to build these Corvettes. And um, the remarkable thing is that, that shipyards in Owen Sound and Collingwood and Midland and Toronto and Kingston and uh, in St. John and up in, in Rimouski and Quebec City, these were grinding these things out because the $50 million that was required to do it was suddenly handed over because C.D. Howe, a.k.a. the Minister of Everything, delivered mm -hmm. and insisted that this be done. And so uh, the Corvette became that mass-produced uh, vehicle, the backbone of the escorts, and uh, they, were, they were the bane of those poor crews bobbing around on the ocean like corks. In fact, one of the chapters in my book, I refer to a, a phrase a, a young man said, we were, we were brotherhood to a cork living in those <laughs> Corvettes. Um, well, so and talk, talk about the ability of the Corvette. So easy and quick to build, as you said, the shallow draft and the fact we were pumping these out at a ferocious pace, they were also incredibly agile and quick, which allowed for the convoy, of course, the, them to respond quickly to to the U-boat threat. Talk about that for a moment. Well, the Corvettes were, um, they were the best of ships and the worst of ships. Um, if you could survive the rattling that you went uh, through as a, as a crewman on board these things, uh, remember too that their living space on the average Corvette, about 200 feet long and about 33, feet wide was about the size of a Canadian bungalow, about 1,600 square feet of living space. So you got 85 to 100 men rattling around in what essentially amounts to the same size as a Canadian bungalow for two to three weeks without showers. <laughs> Not fun. But um, as many of the commanders recognized who uh, led these uh, agile, quick, albeit uh, overly buoyant ships to sea to war, discovered they had the ability to inside turn a U-boat on the surface, which was critical in order to attack or chase or ram them, and then drop depth charges, these um, essentially big drums of TNT, which were hydrostatically set not to explode on contact with U-boats, to explode by the water pressure at the depth setting they were set at. So if, they, if they're ASDEC, the, the primitive sonar that the Corvettes had to read where the U-boats were submerged at 50 or 100 or 200 feet deep, they could set the hydrostatic settings on the depth charges to explode at that depth. And these were lethal because the concussions uh, of these explosions, if close enough to the U-boats, could destroy them. So this was, their, this was their, their pushback, the Corvettes. The problem they had was that there were too few of them too early on, and they didn't have all of the most um, sophisticated equipment of detection to find out where the U-boats were mm -hmm. or the weapons to fight with them, uh, such as they got later on. The U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy had had these weapons all along. We were the poor sisters in Canada not getting them until 1943. And then we turned the corner and pushed the U-boats back. And essentially the Black Pit was overwhelmed by our forces, not theirs. Mm -hmm. So oh, as we started arriving at the numbers sufficient to properly guard the convoys, we saw the losses of both men and goods going down as we, as we had the ships to respond. I, I noticed that there's a foreword of your book uh, written by Gordon Lacko, 
who was the naval advisor uh, on Tom Hanks' movie The Greyhound, uh, an amazing movie, I think. And there's a Canadian ship featured in Greyhound, and is in your in your take was the movie and the the Canadian interaction all pretty pretty true to form in your take. Well, it's interesting because I talk to a lot of people about that movie. I use the movie. Uh, in my introduction, every time I, I do a talk on the Battle of the Atlantic, and I've now done about 115 of them since the book came out last fall, um, a lot of people are offended that the Americans are in this movie. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Americans were part of the escort service. They just came to the party late. <laughs> I mean, they, By they, the time we had better numbers, then, then we had overwhelming numbers right. with them. But what's interesting is that, and, and Gordon's a good friend, and that's why I asked him to read the manuscript before we published it, because he's a Navy guy and I'm not. And I asked him, I said, Gordon, you did the, the, the advising on the movie, which looked pretty good in terms of mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the critical eye and, and the people who know better say it's, it's powerfully done and accurately done. I said... I want you to read my manuscript and look for mistakes, which he did. And then he said, can I write the introduction to it? He liked it that much. But the movie is um, pretty accurate because everything that, that uh, Gordon told them to do, um, right down to the details of the navigation tables and the way Hanks delivered the orders as commander aboard the American frigate and the way the combat scenes went, was accurate. The one thing that he that's depicted in the movie that Gordon said he protested. He said, "No, no, no, don't do this." Was when they put the scenes in where the Germans were apparently eavesdropping on the communications between the warships on the surface. That was a totally Hollywood manufactured uh, aspect. They didn't have that, but it made the movie more dramatic and uh, more threatening, I guess. But otherwise, it's it's a fairly accurate uh, representation. The one thing that Gordon pointed out to me that I'd forgotten was. The movie was done entirely on green screen, mm -hmm. which means that none of the scenes that you see of the interaction between the Corvette, the one Canadian Corvette, and the American frigate, and the other ships in that convoy, it's all done with them standing in front of green screens and superimposed digitally animated computer uh, images behind them, right down to the water. All of the wave action you see of the ships going through on the, in the movie, they went to sea for several days, shot different colors and waveforms, and then superimposed all of that into the movie. So in a way, it's a, it's a manufactured war story, not a real one. And they didn't have to freeze their tail off on the on the North Atlantic like our no, sailors and merchant. They can retreat to the Hollywood trailers. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk. Well, let's finish off on the Corvettes because many of the veterans from Battle of the Atlantic that I had the privilege of of meeting, um, including Alex Pollowin, who was a veteran that represented Canada at some of the major international commemorations and was someone I got to know quite well. Many of them served on Corvettes throughout the time. There was the Flower series, so there was a number of Corvettes named after flowers, but most were named after Canadian towns and cities. There's a, there was a Bowmanville, where I'm from, right. uh, and the Naval Memorial, the last floating Corvette, is the Sackville in Halifax. Talk a little bit about the way that, that these ships were named and the, and the connections to, to the country and the community. Well, again, that was a C.D. Howe invention, because... Uh, just to, to contradict you slightly, there were more flower class uh, Corvettes built, about 255 of them initially, before the city named or the town named ones okay. emerged. And how went, and the government went looking for support, ground grassroots support from communities to help mm -hmm. donate funds to help build the Corvettes. And that happened in Bowmanville, and it happened in Oakville, and it happened in Camrose, and it happened in Chambly, and it happened all over the country so that... Um, the public was seen to be stepping up and, and joining the effort, the war effort, with their hard-earned pay. What was interesting was that some of the cities went even further than just donating money for the construction of the Corvettes. The city of Regina actually donated additional funds in a purse so that if HMCS Regina, the Corvette, sank a U-boat, all the sailors would share in the prize. Oh, nice. And of course, she did. She sank a U-boat, an Italian U-boat, in January 1943, and the sailors got to share the prize. So that's really stepping up and being part of the war effort uh, right down to the, the, the last moment. 
what I'd like to maybe zero in on for a moment, and, and um, this is critical, is we've sort of alluded to the fact that the Corvettes were pretty damn good at maneuvering at sea and chasing the U-boats, but it really required some additional tactical expertise, and that was supplied by and, and invented by very creative Corvette commanders. Um, I'm, I'm spent a lot of time investigating uh, the career of a guy named James Douglas Chummy Prentice. When, once you see a picture of this guy, you see that he's a character. He wore a monocle on his right eye, and that's because <laughs> during the first war, he was in the, the Royal Navy, was at the Battle of Jutland, returns to Canada as a rancher, goes back to BC, where he's working with his cattle and his, and his horses. He was known as the monocled cowboy. Um, and he comes back into service in the Second World War because uh, then Rear Admiral um, Leonard Murray realizes that Prentice is, has experience, he has this capability of relating to, to men who are in need of training, and Murray assigns him first to Halifax to be part of the uh, Halifax escort service and to train the Corvette crews off the south shore of Nova Scotia, which he does. And But he's he's kind of anxious because... He doesn't want the Corvettes to be in the mindset of simply defending, reacting, being sheepdogs, wrangling mm -hmm. the, the convoys, which were traveling in nine columns wide and about five or six ships deep. He didn't want to be, uh, have his crews think that they were only there to defend the convoys. He wanted to make sure that they were there to attack the U-boats too. And so Murray, Admiral Murray, wisely transfers Chummy Prentice from training his crews off Halifax to St. John's, where he's head of the Newfoundland Escort Force. And why is that important? Because he's 500 miles closer to the Battle of the Atlantic, and so the training he's doing with his crews can become even more quickly available within a day or a day and a half of the battle at sea. And of course, you know what happens. Mm -hmm. He takes his tactics, and, and I go into great deal, detail in the book as to how we shape these crews into machines in terms of their tactics at sea. For example, one small thing, when the Aztec, this sonar device, detected a U-boat, um, the problem that had, been, had existed early in the war was that uh, if a Corvette was operating alone, the commander of the Corvette would naturally accelerate the Corvette to the location where the U-boat was spotted by Aztec and drop the depth charges. The problem was that as you accelerated the engines of a Corvette, you masked out the Aztec uh, readings, which meant that the, if the U-boat took a swift turn or a dive, you didn't know exactly where it was. Well, Chummy Prentice said, why don't we work in tandem? Why don't we have one Corvette monitoring on Aztec where the U-boat is and another Corvette dropping the depth charges, independent of each other, but communicating with each other? Mm -hmm. So this is a tactic he brings to the war effort off Greenland in uh, April or May of 1941, and a tandem attack on a U-boat 501 sinks it, and they're the first crews to do so because Chummy Prentice, because Chummy Prentice turned the Corvette crews from sheepdogs into subkillers. Brilliant tactician and also a great character. Sheepdogs into wolves themselves, hunting yes. the wolf back. Yeah, no. That's fantastic. And so over the course of the war, as we're not only going from 13 ships to 400, the tactics are evolving so that by the time the Americans join, the, the sort of Greyhound era, I guess you could say, we're already having better success and fewer lost ships because of better convoy sizes and, and better tactics. Is that yeah. fair to say? And experience. Experience. Yeah. And it's the same in the Air Force, Aaron. I can't, we can't not talk about the Air Force, especially with, with your service. And there's, a, there's an equivalent of Chummy Prentice in the Air Force. One of the problems that the Air Force faced was, again, not, not just the ability to get out far enough to keep them to supply the, the air coverage over the Black Pit, but also when they were required to attack the U-boats, too often they only had bombs in their bomb racks. Now, bombs are only good if you hit something. What they needed were depth charges. Um, mm -hmm. One of the men whose stories I pursue was a guy named uh, Norval Everett Molly. They all had nicknames. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Molly Small was his name. He, he was from Allendale near Barrie. In fact, it Barrie's absorbed Allendale now. Anyway, he too was a First World War vet veteran. He'd gone through the Royal Flying Corps, came back to Canada, 
uh, flies bush planes into the north during the mm -hmm. between the wars period. Then he gets recruited by the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan to train crews in the Maritimes during the Battle of the Atlantic. So now he's training his crews the same way Chummy Prentice was training the Corvette crews off uh, St. John's all around uh, the Maritime provinces. Molly Small is training his crews to attack the U-boats from the air. And mm -hmm. so he suggests, why don't we forget the bombs, let's install depth charges in our Cansos and our Hudsons, our twin engine aircraft. And one of the other problems that he recognized, and he, he talked to a lot of coastal command crews, and one of the things he learned was that when the U-boats were in our waters, in Canadian waters, they always had, if they were on the surface, they always had a scout in the conning tower, the superstructure of the, of the U-boat, scanning the skies, looking for enemy aircraft, aircraft that could attack them. Why was it, Molly Small said, all our aircraft have dark painted bellies and underwing. Why don't we paint them white? Which they did, which ultimately makes the aircraft invisible to that scout in the conning tower of the U-boat. And let's stop attacking at 100 feet. Let's attack from 5,000 feet making us even less visible and using steep dives to attack the U-boats with the depth charges. And you know what happens. Molly Small, in his first attempt with the bombs, fails to sink a U-boat. But four months later, in 1941, his crew attacks with depth charges from a Hudson, and they sink a U-boat, the first Royal Canadian Air Force Eastern Air Command crew to do so in the Second World War. Why? Because he recognized the shortcomings of their attacks and took the disadvantages, turned them around to advantages, and ultimately trains his crews to become sub killers, not simply um, uh, air surveillance crews. That's fascinating. And both with the depth charges, I'm assuming both the Corvettes and the the aircraft on patrol would know that by the time they spotted a, a U-boat and went in for the tack, whether the dive or whether positioning the vessel closer to, that the the descend rate for the sub, they could almost plan what to set their depth charge to, knowing the time involved. And if it was set properly, that concussion would take out the U-boat. Is that was that part of the calculation? Like how 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 deep they would sink to avoid attack and they'd be able to adjust the depth charges to that to that uh, depth? Yes, and the, and the longer they were at sea, and the more repeated uh, attempts, whether on a Corvette or in a Hudson or a Canso, uh, and searching for the U-boats, the more they recognized the patterns that the U-boat commanders used to evade. If they were deep divers, they could get that, as you suggest, the, the rate of descent. But if they also tried to divert, like take sharp turns underwater, ASDIC, and the better equipment that the uh, Corvettes had and that the Air Force had later in the war, allowed them to literally see where those U-boats were going. The Air Force had um, initially something called air-to-surface radar. So if you were at 5,000 feet, uh, a Canso or a Hudson could spot a U-boat and not be spotted in return, mm -hmm. and then make that deep dive or, or swift dive and attack against the U-boat and be more effective. Um, the uh, Corvettes stuck with the ASDEC of the initial part of the war, got a more sophisticated radar later on, and they were able to overcome the problems of the acceleration noise of the engines to detect where the U-boats were going and make their depth charge drops more accurate. So yeah. we got better as the war went along through experience, better equipment, which the Americans and the British had had all along, and we almost lost the battle in late in 1942 because we didn't have that equipment. We were stretched so thin, and we were really the poor sisters of the three navies until we got the training and the right equipment to be able to fight back the, the U-boats and become sub-killers. And the ASDEC was basically sonar, so you'd be pinging out a single. So you, the, the U-boats knew you were there, too, from the ping, yes. whereas the, the Air Force, as you said, that passive role would allow them to to have surprise in terms of the but attack. The, the ASDIC was, uh, was, had one Achilles heel, and that was that while it could give a ping on a submerged U-boat, a U-boat on the surface could be just flotsam and jetsam and, uh, or a whale or a curve, uh, a, a crest, and the mm -hmm. ASDIC couldn't detect the difference. So the U-boats mm -hmm. were invisible on the surface. And that's what the, Carl Dunitz, who was the commander of the U-boat Waffe, he said, stay on the surface. You're faster, more maneuverable, and you're invisible because you can't, ASDIC couldn't yeah. see you. Uh, fascinating. Although if you're being uh, fought with a joint air and naval resources, it's on the surface that the air can get you. Um, it's fascinating. I was 
anti-submarine warfare uh, on Sea Kings, right? And so Sea Kings used, the ones I flew on anyway, used a active sonar, a dipping sonar at the bottom of the helicopter. You would dip, ping, find or push the submarine. But there was also passive detection, listening, listening for the the sound and the and the the screw noise in the yep. water of the submarines. And so now the technology has that ability to passively track an attack. So I find it as a as an ex maritime aviator quite fascinating. So you've talked about a couple of uh, incredible air and naval veterans from it. Um, talk about women. Uh, Talk about one of the one of the women you focus on in the Battle of the Atlantic uh, in your in your book Battle of the Atlantic Gauntlet to Victory. Well, for many years, I used to share Remembrance Day duties in the Toronto area with a woman named Margaret Loos. Her married name was Halliburton, Margaret Halliburton. Um, and at the beginning of the war, she really wanted to participate. She wanted to do something, but there were no frontline uh, roles allowed for women in any of the services. Uh, until 1942, and that's when the government allowed the creation of the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Volunteers, the Wrens. Mm -hmm. And Margaret, who was in Toronto and was taking care of her mom because her mom was frail and widowed, was itching to go, but she didn't want to abandon her mom. And her mom finally Ted said to her, I got a bunch of, bunch of wimps for daughters. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, she was wondering why her daughters weren't going off to serve. Well, Margaret said, but I thought you needed me here. She said, I want you to have a life. <laughs> so Margaret joins the Wrens and she's trained in um, Galt. Um, and then she goes to a place called Coverdale, which is in uh, the, uh, it's a stone frigate, as the Navy re refers to the land-based uh, uh, naval bases, uh, in just outside Moncton. And she works in something called high-frequency direction finding, Huff Duff. And you'll know that from your, yep. your experience. Huff Duff was a way, it was very primitive, but it worked. They discovered in the First World War that when lightning struck somewhere, radios not only crackled with the static of the response of that electricity, radios could also locate where the lightning had struck the earth. And so they used that principle to essentially monitor, and this is what Margaret did for three years, she monitored on Huff Duff on headsets, sitting in Moncton, listening for that crackle of a transmission of a U-boat sending a message back to occupied Europe. And the Germans didn't know we had this. So if you could triangulate on that location with two Huff Duff operators, which Margaret and her colleagues did, they could determine where the U-boat was. And then Margaret would leave her position in her radio room, run down the hall to a location that would then Morse code send that information, the locations they had triangulated on, to Bletchley Park in England, where they were breaking Enigma codes. They could combine that naval intelligence with the Huff Duff operations and they could determine where the U-boats were, and as you referred to it earlier, passively avoid the U-boats sending the convoys away from them without the U-boats realizing they, we knew where they were. She was known as one of the listeners throughout the <laughs> war, and she was brilliant at it. She was actually on the air in 1945 when in plain German in April, uh, Hitler's suicide was announced, and that the command of the Reich had passed from Hitler to Donitz, and then Donitz, the commander of the U-Boat Waffe, tells the U-Boats to surrender across the world in early May of 1945, and she was there. She was one of the listeners throughout the war. Brilliant career, highly um, vital in determining the locations of U-Boats, but certainly under-celebrated as, as a, a game changer in the Battle of the Atlantic. That's fascinating. I haven't even heard of uh, of that tactic that we use. So obviously, to get a fix, you would need these monitors. The listeners would be on both sides of the Atlantic and in different locations so that you'd get the, the fixes to be able to cross one yeah. another to get locations. So we had, and were these, you know, the Wrens did this in Canada. Did uh, women also serve in these roles in the UK where you'd have similar listeners to cross fix the yeah, location yeah. we could we could hear uh, margaret told me that she could in moncton she could hear those transmission uh, static points uh, as far away as the bay of biscay which is just wow. off the coast of france yeah and the germans had no idea we had this the the battle of the atlantic aaron is probably the classic case of a of a battle of attrition they had the advantage we overcame it 
We had the advantage, they overcame it. It's a seesaw back and forth. There's a critical point in the, in the war, in the Battle of the Atlantic, when the Germans developed what were known as acoustic torpedoes. These were torpedoes that were attracted to the sound that a propeller of a warship makes underwater traveling through the ocean. And the torpedoes would home in on that propeller and blast the stern of a destroyer or a, or a corvette instantly and then sink the ship. Within days of the first attack, I think it was in 1942 that um, the first of the acoustic torpedoes came along, maybe 43. Um, within days of it, the Canadians had invented an anti-acoustic device. It was a called decoy. a cat. Yes, yeah. exactly. It was, it was a decoy. And it was essentially a tether thrown off the stern of the warship with a noisemaker creating the same frequency of noise as the propeller, only about two or 300 yards behind the ship. And inevitably, the acoustic torpedoes would go to the cat and destroy it and save the ship. In fact, there's one moment, um, one of the guys uh, I interviewed, he remembered being on the Murmansk run. And he was on board his Corvette and was looking astern and to, and to starboard back about two or 300 yards. And there was another Corvette, um, they were traveling in tandem, and he suddenly saw the path of a torpedo coming between them and it went right to the cat and exploded at the cat and saved both corvettes from uh, any interruption or, or, or um, uh, destruction amazing incredible and the innovation we've talked earlier about ramping up from 13 ships to 400 ships the innovation both uh, in the air on the sea under the sea the defensive measures the uh, the detection measures the wrens were doing pretty incredible but let's let's end with a little discussion about the convoys themselves that million tons of equipment and supplies needed for the uk each week for the war effort for the civilian population it was hoisted on the backs of the merchant navy and as a as i said at the outset the losses for the merchant navy were as high as the, the naval forces themselves. And so the the 3,500 merchant vessels lost during the Battle of the Atlantic shows the incredible toll members of the, of the merchant navy had in the war. And it took them until the mid-1990s to receive support and recognition from Veterans Affairs for their incredible war effort. Talk about that long journey of, of recognition that the merchant navy had to go through uh, and the risks they took as part of the success of the Battle of the Atlantic. One thing you have to remember, and this was the, the caveat that the, uh, the government used to exclude merchant sailors from becoming veterans, was that the, all of the merchant sailors were civilians. They were employed by civilian uh, private enterprise firms, which built the ships or bought them and then ran the companies privately to deliver the goods so that everybody on board a merchant ship was a civilian, albeit within the ranks of, of the merchant navy, you could have an officer or an able seaman, the same as ranks that would exist in the military. Um, and I interviewed a number of merchant sailors. Um, one was the dad of a fellow I play old timers hockey with, a guy named Steve Ray uh, in Oshawa. Steve and I play summer hockey together. And one day we were sitting a couple of summers ago before I got this all going. And he said, uh, I hear you're doing a book on the Battle of the United. He said, my dad was in the Merchant Navy. I said, really? He said, yeah, I, I've got his memoirs and some videotape. Well, I was just, I gobbled it up. Um, mm -hmm. And Rob Ray, this Steve's dad, um, was actually, uh, he was in Toronto and the war broke out and he immediately went to the Air Force Enlistment Center to become a fighter pilot. <laughs> Didn't, didn't you all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they said, sorry, you haven't got enough education qualifications. And he immediately goes to Halifax and joins the Merchant Navy. He sensed that that was the second most important thing to do. And he loved those guys watching them come back from their ships being torpedoed and immediately jumping on new ships to go back to sea to serve the Merchant Navy. So Rob Ray um, uh, joins the Merchant Navy. He had a bit of a radio background, so he becomes a radio operator. And he went to sea with the Park ships. Uh, the Park Company was one of the Canadian independent private enterprise firms that built ships named after famous Canadian parks. So there was the Jasper and all the others. In any case, he was on one of those, um, served for three years crossing the North Atlantic. His job was critical in, in more than just communications. He was the last guy standing between the secret records that every ship bore um, 
of their codes, of their directions, of their, their paths. It was called um, uh, Bamsi and Campsi, the Canadian, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it was, the, it was the intelligence documents that every merchant ship carried. His job, if their ship was torpedoed, was to take all of those secret documents, put them in a metal cage, which was full of holes, make sure it was locked, and as their ship was going down, toss the cage overboard so that those documents didn't fall into the U-boat's hands. Then he could tap out an SOS to identify where his ship was sinking and then abandon ship with the rest of the crew. That's what he had to be trained to do. And he did it for three years. Fortunately, none of his ships was sunk. He comes back at the end of the war, Rob does. He gets medals that the government awarded the merchant sailors, volunteer, North Atlantic, all that stuff. And he then seeks some compensation as a veteran to get improvement in his radio skills so he can augment his radio skills, go back to civilian life, and indeed earn a, a decent wage as a radio operator somewhere in communications. They said, sorry, you're in the Merchant Navy. You're not considered veterans. We can't help you. No benefits for you. Rob was stunned, absolutely mortified. He took his medals off and he threw them in his drawer, never to look at them again, he thought. Then in the 1980s. These same guys who have been denied those rights, denied that capability of joining all the other veterans who'd served and getting some compensation and some assistance in life getting back to City Street. These guys fight tooth and nail, going to the Canadian Senate, doing uh, all kinds of, of demonstrations in front of us, the media, to get their attention. They went on a hunger strike at one point so that they could get the veteran status that would allow them the chance to get an education, improve their status in life, maybe get some money for housing, maybe some health care assistance, all those other things that all the other veterans coming back to Sibby Street had had since 1945, they didn't get until 1994. Suddenly, after all this pressure and all this campaigning, and now there are fewer and fewer of them, Rob and his colleagues win that right. And in 1994, on November the 11th, for the first time, Merchant Navy sailors are allowed to be present and to participate at the National Monument and Rob Ray's uh, medals are seen on his chest as he lays that first wreath at the National Memorial for the first time in his life recognized as a veteran of the Second World War. It was a proud moment for him and his son Steve and it's in my book because that's why these guys were so uh, important to the effort, the war effort. Well, thank you. They certainly were. They were core to the Battle of the Atlantic uh, and its success and the success of the overall Allied effort. Interestingly, just this morning, I took uh, some friends on a tour of, of Parliament and went to the Room of Remembrance, which oh, is great. representing the Memorial Chamber, which, of course, in center block at the base of the Tower of Peace and Victory is, is closed at the moment. But I showed them all the books of remembrance, including for the Merchant Navy. And the, you know, hundreds of Canadians whose names are listed on those pages who who died in the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, so I think personalizing this, as you just did with the Ray family, is good because I do. I have met many veterans, one of the blessings of my job and seeing how the Merchant Navy felt they were excluded for so long was uh, was sad. And there were a lot of guys that didn't survive till 94 to see that recognition finally come. So listen, Ted, this has been a fascinating discussion, holding that up one more time, Battle of the Atlantic, Gauntlet to Victory. Gauntlet to Victory, the subtitle, what led to that? Was it just how critical this battle was to the overall success, the, the reason why it was the one thing that really worried and frightened Churchill during the war, that the gauntlet to victory, without, without its success, the Allies might have perished? I think gauntlet is, is the appropriate uh, word because it represents a number of um, potentially uh, killer forces in this in, entire equation. I mean, if, if we hadn't been able to supply, if the Merchant Navy hadn't been able to supply Britain with all its necessities and, and uh, uh, you know, staple foods and ammunition, so, I mean, Churchill would have been operating the war from Ottawa. In fact, in 1940, because there was so much fear that an invasion was going to happen, the Germans coming across the channel into Britain, that Churchill ordered all of the sterling 
and all of the securities in Britain to be convoyed to Canada. Mm -hmm. In my book, I described um, Operation Fish, which was this transport of all of the, um, uh, the money in Britain, if you like, sent to Canada in case Churchill did have to operate the war from, from, from Canada and from Ottawa. But the gauntlet, I think, too, is the, the, the catch-up that Canadians had to achieve to get in, back into this battle. We almost lost it in 42 when in December of 42, the Canadians are responsible for 80% of the losses in the convoys at that point. And Churchill tells them, uh, tells King, I want the Canadians off the North Atlantic. And King says, okay, but give us the equipment, give us the means, give us the, the, the improved training. And the Canadians are pulled off. The losses get worse because the Americans and the Brits are no better at it than we were, and they had better equipment. The Canadians are retrained. They go to the, to the Mediterranean to escort ships to, in Operation Torch to North Africa. And guess what happens in 1943? In one month, the Canadian Navy's, uh, the Corvettes sink three U-boats in the Mediterranean. Suddenly, they've got the capability, the training, and the proper equipment. And of course, the Mediterranean is a much, much simpler body of water to operate in. And, and Lord Mountbatten uh, reviews the, the Canadians in Algiers and calls them a bloody, tough-looking tough bunch of bastards. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he thinks that, they're, and they're sent back to the North Atlantic. And by May of 1943, Black May, as Admiral Dunitz calls it, the U-boat packs are broken, the tide turns, and the convoys begin to get through the Black Pit. And this is all that gauntlet of uh, of the war. And then there's the weather. I mean, mm -hmm. how many times have you heard? And you were when you were on board the, the the frigate. If you went in northern waters, inevitably those ships, even today, get overwhelmed by the ice in bad weather in the winter and every man on board or and every woman on board these days goes to work chopping the ice off the ships so that they don't topple because they become top heavy with the ice it was even more critical in the battle of the atlantic that 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 gauntlet had to be run and and running the gauntlet to murmansk i mean this this book is full of gauntlets <laughs> essentially <laughs> we ran them all and ultimately prevailed fascinating the innovation, the ramping up of the war effort, the personal courage and individual stories. Battle of the Atlantic, truly one of the most fascinating periods, most critical periods of World War II. And this is just a few weeks after Battle of the Atlantic Sunday, which we celebrate in, in early May each year. So, Ted Barris, thank you for your incredible storytelling. Thank you for making sure Canadians are aware of our rich military heritage and history and belated congratulations on your order of canada a nice recognition for what you've done preserving our history and telling our story aaron it's always a pleasure to, to speak with you and to, to chat and have a conversation i've i've always enjoyed it i'm going to miss it if if for some reason these podcasts don't continue given that your future is, is changing as we speak uh, it's always been a pleasure and an honor and a, and a wonderful opportunity to share uh, a similar love of these stories and the men and women they represent. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ted. Interesting note. And uh, for our viewers, uh, Ted Barris hosted the first debate I took part in <laughs> as a uh, first time nominee candidate for the Conservatives in Uxbridge, I think at the public library or somewhere. He hosted the debate. Little did I know that we'd become friends and, and share this passion so well. So thank you for being on the Blue Skies. And if you have any questions about Ted's book about the Battle of the Atlantic, or if you have suggestions for a topic that you'd like to hear Blue Skied here on the Blue Skies podcast, send us a note, share this podcast. It's up to us to hold the torch of remembrance high. Check out Ted's book, tell the Canadian story, and thank a veteran when you see them. I'm Aaron O'Toole. Thanks for tuning in to another Blue Skies.